Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations, and welcome back to the channel for this installment of Open Mic, the, the show where the floor is open. The, the discourse is up to you. What do you guys want to talk about? That is what we are here to discuss. My name, of course, is John Campia. Good to have you guys here. And yeah, Open Mic is just uh, more of a casual, laid-back version of the show. Really, it's just more, we're just hanging out. We're just going to hang out, chat, and talk about movies for the next hour or so. I'm going to take your questions and all kinds of stuff. There are two different ways to get a question on the show. So one of the ways is anytime, 24 hours a day, that you think you have a question from an open mic, you can use our tip link to submit a question. Our tip link is seen right here, streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tips. You can send that in there and then we'll get around to that on the next uh, show or two. Or if you happen to be watching the show live, you can use the super chat feature in the live chat and send in a question that way and we will address it then now I'm going to let you guys know that we got a, a bunch of we have over 17 pages of uh, questions from the tip link lined up because we didn't do an open mic last week. Of course, my voice was not doing so good. It's still not 100 <clears throat> percent. You're going to hear me do that every once in a while, uh, but we're we're probably not going to get through all the tip questions today. So we're going to have another open mic tomorrow. We'll get caught up uh, by then and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, that is how today's show is going to go. Good to have you guys here. A little bit of an update um, on my uh, my health. My health is pretty good. My Actually, my health is really good. It has been pretty good for a couple of weeks. The problem has just been my, my chest congestion and my voice, right? That's been it. It's just my inability <clears throat> to talk. And by the time we got around to like Thursday last week, I was sounding like this when I was talking and it was just really, really, really bad. So I took a couple of days off. Uh, the voice is doing better uh, as you guys can hear. So, um, so that's what's going on and, and we're, it, we're good to go now. Also, I got great news today. I got pictures from my sister. My mom, after nearly two full years in the hospital, uh, my mom has gone home today which is great. My sister sent out pictures of my mom finally being home today. So I'm in a very good mood. I'm in a very, very, very good mood uh, right now. So, uh, so it's a good time to talk about some movie stuff. Good time to talk about some movie stuff. Now, listen, before we get into your questions, I, I, you know, we like to have a theme or a topic for every open mic. So I went into our community tab on the YouTube channel. And for those of you who don't check out our community tab, we I basically tweet, treat the community tab like my own personal social media. Um, make sure you're checking out our community tab in there. Anyway, I asked people in our community tab a little bit earlier, uh, like, what do you think should be our topic today that we lead off open mic with? And a couple of people uh, basically said the same thing, which was, you know, how important is this Deadpool trailer that's coming up at the Super Bowl, and what are the sorts of things they need to do in the Deadpool trailer to get everybody really excited, right? <laughs> because, listen, and I, I say this as a fan of the MCU. A lot of people lately have been online say Campy is an MCU hater. I, I swear to God, my entire career, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said I'm an MCU hater to be immediately followed up by somebody else saying I'm an MCU shill, I would be a very, very rich, rich man. But I am no MCU hater, right? I've been a big fan of the MCU for a long time, but that does not mean I turn off my brain and I turn off my, you know, judgment uh, when things start to go bad. And the MCU is not in its healthiest place right now. I, can we at least agree on that? Even if you're a huge MCU lover, can we at least all agree? Maybe we'll disagree about how bad it is, but can we at least all agree that the MCU is not exactly in its healthiest spot right now? Can we agree on that? I think most people would agree on that. So with, with mediocrity... By the way, there is no such thing as comic book movie fatigue. We've gone over this a thousand times. People do not have comic book movie fatigue. If comic book movie fatigue was a real thing, it would have set in seven years ago, okay? We went like 13 straight years of everything. And everybody's saying, comic book movie fatigue, so it never did. You know when fatigue started setting in? When the movie started getting really bland and really mediocre. People, audiences have mediocrity fatigue. They don't have comic book movie fatigue. Anyway, that being said, 
We got Deadpool 3 coming now. And there is going to be a Deadpool 3 trailer at Super Bowl. So what does this trailer need to do? Well, as somebody in the live chat a little bit earlier said, put Taylor Swift in it, in the trailer. And honestly, I know that that sounds on the surface like a good move, but the reality is... Um, like Taylor Swift was in a couple of movies in the last couple of years, like Amsterdam. And, and there was another one too. And guess what? Nobody went to go see those. Taylor Swift fans are huge, huge fans, but that doesn't mean they're going to go watch her paint a house, you know, or necessarily in a movie. And I'm not saying it would be a mistake to put Taylor Swift in the trailer. And by the way, we don't even know if she's in the movie or not for sure. Yeah. Cats. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, Mouse Mouseman said, yeah, cats. So cats, so, uh, Taylor Swift was in cats and she was in Amsterdam and nobody went to go see those movies. So I don't think putting Taylor Swift in the trailer would necessarily move the needle. That being said, there are a couple of things I think the Deadpool trailer needs to do. The number one is obvious. It's gotta be a great trailer, right? Okay. But what do they need to do within this trailer? Number one, show the humor of Deadpool. I still think there are a lot of people that are a little bit nervous about the fact that this is no longer the Fox Deadpool. This is now Marvel's Deadpool. And will Marvel let Ryan Reynolds and his guys still be Deadpool? Now, obviously, you can't swear a bunch in a, in a television commercial, right, on the Super Bowl. But at least show clips that let the audience know this is still the Deadpool you know and love. This is still the Deadpool from Deadpool 1 and Deadpool 2, right? And I think that's going to be key. I mean, yeah, do other things that a good action movie or a comic book movie trailer. Show some explosions, so show some action. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. Put all that in there. But they got to make sure that the tone, the feel, the DNA of this Deadpool trailer really announces to the audience that this is still the Deadpool you know and love. All right. I think that's absolutely of paramount importance that they do that. Okay. So that's number one. <clears throat> number two, I think you show glimpses of the cameos. Now, Rob and I had a disagreement about this earlier today. You know, Rob, Rob was of the mindset. And I think a lot of people would agree with him on this because um, <laughs> Rob's always very well thought out. So Rob was kind of saying that, um, you know, you don't want to do what Dr. Strange, the multiverse of madness do, where you show a lot of the, 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 the cameos in advance and you really should just focus on Deadpool and Wolverine. And I get that I do, but remember what is a trailer? A trailer is a piece of marketing. First and foremost, a trailer is a piece of marketing and we, we talked about this on the John Campus show earlier. And I mentioned to Rob, I said, you know, you brought up Dr. Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and that they showed a lot of the cameos in the trailers. Well, did it work? Dr. Strange and the Multiverse of Madness opened up. Let me, let me bring this up. Uh, let's see here. Multiverse of Madness. Let me see if I can find this. Here we go. <clears throat> I'm going to bring this up here. Now remember, trailers are marketing. Marketing is to get people into the theaters on opening weekend. After opening weekend, it's up to word of mouth. But opening weekend is all about the marketing. So what did the marketing, showing all these cameos in their trailers do? What did that do? The movie opened to $187 million. One of the biggest opening weekends, minimum top 20. I think it's got to be top 20 minimum. Biggest opening weekends in Hollywood history. When in an era when kind of comic book movies are declining, right? This movie with the strategy that they had for their marketing, showing a lot of little cameos, $187 million opening weekend. So that strategy that they had worked. So number one, well, I mean, number one is obvious, make a really good trailer. Okay, but so number one, uh, make sure you show in this trailer that this is still the same Deadpool. This is the Deadpool we know and love. Number two, I think you got to show a bunch of the, the wackiness, the cameos, right? 
Give us a little glimpse of Jennifer. Well, you know, I'm a Jennifer Garner guy, but give us a little glimpse of Jennifer Garner in there, right? As Electra. Give us a glimpse of Halle Berry back as Storm. You know, give us those little bits because I think that's going to get people very excited. And if you don't agree, again, I point you to the opening weekend of Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness. And they really, really need that to happen. All right. So there's that. Third. If point number one is that remind everybody that this is the Deadpool we know and love, I'd say third thing is tell people, make this trailer tell people this is the best of the MCU. Not that Deadpool 3 is going to be the best MCU movie they've ever made. I'm saying in the same way that we're saying make the trailer so everybody remembers this is the same Deadpool we know and love, remind everybody of the best parts of the MCU and put that in there. Have one or two jokes that really hit home. Show a couple of great visual effect shots. Make sure we see a quick glimpse of Wolverine and Deadpool going at each other, right? With blades out and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> like things that MCU trailers used to do really well. And I think if this Deadpool Super Bowl trailer can pull off those three things, right? Remind people that this is the Deadpool we know and love. Number two, show off some, some of the, the bonkers and the cameos because that's worked already very, very well for them. And number three, make people think about the best of the MCU in general. I think if this trailer can pull that off, <coughs> I think it'll bode very, very well for Deadpool 3 moving forward. I think it'll bode very well for the MCU as a whole. Because Deadpool 3, let's not forget, is the only Marvel cinematic movie coming out in all of 2024. Which is good. They could use a little bit of a break right now. And if they can come out with a banger Deadpool 3, and then everybody's got to wait six, seven, eight, nine months for the next MCU movie, we're all sitting on what our last experience was, a great Deadpool 3 movie. It'll be very, very good for them. But if things go bad, it'll be very, very bad for them, <laughs> right? Because if Deadpool 3 stinks, and I don't think Deadpool 3 will stink, but if it does, then everybody's going to have eight or nine months to just sit and think about, hey, the last MCU movie really sucked. And it was Deadpool, and it sucked. So we'll just have to see. But yeah, there we go. Those are the three things I think the Deadpool trailer needs to do. Remind us of Deadpool we know and love. Number two, show off some of the cameos. I know not everybody will love that, but it'll work. And number three, remind everybody that this is an MCU movie and remind us how good MCU movies can be. If they can pull off those three things, I think this trailer will be a big, big hit. Now, Sosa saying, I don't see how Deadpool can suck. Listen, dude. Many, as somebody who's been in this business a long, long time, there have been many movies where I've heard people and myself say, there's no way that movie can suck. And somehow they find a way. Are you kidding me? The Hangover was brilliant. How can the sequel not be brilliant? Well, guess what? The, uh, the sequel wasn't so brilliant. You know, it can happen. Listen, making a good movie is a very, very hard thing to do. Sometimes there are people who make it look easy, but we as movie fans should never forget making a good, enjoyable movie can be an insanely difficult and hard thing to do. So uh, you better believe that it's possible for, De I mean, I'm, I'm, I am believing Deadpool 3 is going to be great, but I'm not going to forget for one second that it's very possible that it could suck too, right? I'm going in believing the best. But I understand the worst could happen, that it could end up being bad. So, you know, <clears throat> we'll see. We'll see. All right, guys. With that all down, let's get over and start taking your questions here, shall we? And remember, since we didn't do an open mic at all last week, some of these questions will be a little bit out of date as we get caught up here. So hang tight. Here we go. First up, we got Garden Variety Vagabond who writes, <clears throat> concerning ad-free streaming, I always felt that it went contrary to everything that the best of movies has taught us from the depiction of Captain Amazing. Captain Amazing, of course, the uh, Greg Kinnear character in the 
wonderfully ahead of its time mystery men movie. Uh, and it was only time after that before sports teams followed suit. Uh, that was the sign of the future. Of course, some of you, if, for those of you who've seen mystery men, if you have not, you absolutely should. That was a movie that was decades ahead of its time. But you know, Captain Amazing was the, the main kind of uh, hero of that world. And he had sponsorship logos all over him, right? And you're right, today, we have that. I mean, you look at soccer. Like, soccer teams don't even have the name of the team. They have the name of their sponsor on their jersey, which I think is a bit much. Like, at least in the NBA and stuff like that, where they'll have a little sponsor patch on their jersey, their main jersey still says Lakers or Knicks or Celtics, Right. Soccer, they don't even have the name of the team on their jerseys anymore. They don't even have the name of their teams on them anymore. I, I, I don't understand that, to be honest with you. I'm sure they pay a lot of money. I, I still don't really kind of personally understand that. All right. <clears throat> Next up, uh, we've got BK Dan who writes, John, with Netflix acquiring WWE Raw starring January in 2025, what are the odds that there's backroom talks of getting SmackDown 2? Very little. So for those of you who missed that story, Netflix has bought the rights to Monday Night Raw, the WWE show on Monday nights, for $5 billion. I believe it's a 10-year contract, right? 10-year contract at $500 million a year. Is that right? $500 million a year? A anyway, so adds up to a $10 billion deal. <coughs> $10 billion. Now, the WWE also has another show called SmackDown. I don't think you're going to see any talks or things like that for them to acquire SmackDown at the same time. That's a separate entity in many ways. But I think after committing a $5 billion commitment to the WWE, I think if nothing else, um, Netflix will want to see how that goes, right? Like if they get WWE in 2025 and nobody watches it, or like their audience drops in half or whatever, then they're going to be looking for ways to get out of their raw deal. Netflix would be fools to once making a $5 billion commitment to then try to also acquire SmackDown when they don't even know how their raw thing's going to go. So <clears throat> eventually somewhere down the line, years down the line, maybe, but anytime right now, no, I think I personally think they'd be fools to do that. So that that's just me. All right. BK Dan also writes, John, with streamers leaning into corralling us into ad supported tiers, will SGA, I don't know what the SGA is, and uh, WGA, that's the Writers Guild of America, look into residuals like days of yore? Well, see, here's a big misunderstanding, BK Dan. And we talked about this a little bit while when the contract negotiations were going on. Residuals like days of yore, the, the traditional residuals model had nothing to do with commercials. Like a lot of people are un, were under this belief that residuals were actors and writers got a percentage of the ad spots on TV shows. That's not what residuals were. Residuals were originally created in the, the, the traditional model of residuals. This is why it was so hard to figure in residuals into the streaming era because it just doesn't, it, it doesn't work. They're, the old model of residuals does not work with the streaming model. And this is why they never ended up getting residuals. The model of residuals were literally this. A network would run a TV show, right? And then when the TV show was over and sometimes even before it was over, but traditionally, when the TV show was done, right, when the TV show was over, they would then take all, like if a show had three seasons or five seasons, whatever, they'd take those seasons and they'd go to different markets <clears throat> around the U.S. and sell or lease the rights to those shows, the broadcast rights to those shows to different places in different markets. What residuals were was the money the producers would get for now, say, taking, I'm going to make up the name of a show, um, uh, the five seasons of uh, Foot in Ass. Yeah, remember that great show, Foot in Ass? There you go. So the producers of Foot in Ass, they ran it on NBC, but then it was done. Like the show concluded. But for reruns, they would take those five seasons of Foot in Ass and they'd go around to all the different territories around the US and Canada, whatever, and they'd 
sell the, the uh, broadcast rights in different territories. The money from those reselling of broadcast rights is what made up the foundation of residuals. It wasn't commercials, right? <clears throat> so for some reason, a lot of people came under the impression that residuals was, oh, people getting a percentage of the ads that showed on stuff. That's not what residuals were. And anyway, you see where the problem is, right? In today's age, there is no, they used to call it running in syndication. Once a, a show finishes its thing, it would go into syndication. There is no syndication anymore, basically. So <clears throat> no, moving to ad supported stuff does nothing for residuals because residuals never had anything to do with commercials. It, they, they need a new model. They need some kind of a brand new model. And that's why when the screen, the screen actors guild and the WGA were having their, their problems, it was very, very difficult to overcome that because there was just no functioning model that had equivalency right now. Anyway, <clears throat> that's just that. All right, next up, uh, we go to, uh, save legends of tomorrow. Right. Uh, regarding me sending the Suicide Squad DCU question twice, I sent in the first time before you got sick. Then I sent it in again when I heard you were better and I missed the first few open mics where you went above and beyond and answered the backlog of questions. Uh, anyway, on to my new question. Out of the two names currently rumored to be in the final process to play Supergirl, remember, this came in last week before they announced the casting of Supergirl. Uh, in the DCU, who would be your pick, Millie Alcock or Meg Donnelly? Um, <coughs> well, when we first covered the story about the three finalists to play Supergirl, I said, I'm sure all three of them would be great. I'm perfectly good, whichever one they pick. My personal choice would be Millie Alcock. I'm more familiar with her work, but I also believe she showed the, the a huge amount of range in House of the Dragon, the ferocity, the frailty, all at the same time. I thought she was amazing. So I would have been perfectly happy with whoever they picked, but I am very excited they landed on Millie Alcock. I think she's going to be a great Supergirl. I really do. All right, thanks for that, Legends of Tomorrow. Next up, the Chad writes, Hey, John. Hi from Pittsburgh. Uh, that's where my, my wife's company's head office is in Pittsburgh. My wife actually has to fly out to Pittsburgh. Also, home of... Maybe my number one or my number two favorite all-time hockey player, Mario Lemieux. Of course, he's Canadian, but he played for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And now Sid the Kid, Sidney Crosby, whose mom went to school with my mom, apparently. Anyway, um, hey, John. Hi from Pittsburgh. In the past, you've said that Timothy Chalamet would be the next Daniel Day-Lewis. No, 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 no. I never said he would be the next Daniel Day-Lewis. I said, out of all the actors today, he's the one who has the potential to maybe be the next Daniel Day-Lewis. Anyway, is there a young actress who you could think could become an all-time great on that level? Mine would be either Florence Pugh or Anya Taylor-Joy. Um, let's First of all, Florence Pugh and Anya Taylor-Joy are both amazing. They're both great. <clears throat> Do I think they have the potential to be the next Meryl Streep. Because let, let's face it, that would be the, the equivalent comparison, right? Daniel Day-Lewis is simply, I, I call him the Bret Hart of acting. He is the best there is, the best there was, the best there will ever be. No one will ever be as good of an actor as Daniel Day-Lewis. It's Daniel Day-Lewis is the greatest of all time, period, end stop, no discussion, that's it. Daniel Day-Lewis is the greatest actor of all time. Now, that being said, um... When, when I talk about Timothy Chalamet, I mean, I, you look at just how good, I remember back when he was in that movie, I keep forgetting the name, help me out in the live chat, guys, the name of the movie that um, Timothy Chalamet was in with Steve Carell, where he played the drug addict kid and Steve Carell played his dad. It's like, that's my boy. I can't remember, the, I can't remember the name of it. Why, and, and you guys in the live chat, remember the name of that movie? Let me know, uh, write it into the live chat there. But, ah, uh, that's it. Ivan Nava was the first one to fire it in there. Uh, Ivan Nava uh, with a beautiful boy was the name of the movie. Absolutely, absolutely, really, really good movie. Of course, he was then, I can't remember if he got an Oscar nomination. I think he did for Call Me By Your Name. But he, even at that age, you know, like you saw how good he was and he just keeps getting better. And now I just saw him 
We all just saw him recently in Wonka, which turned out to be a big hit for, for the studio. Um, just saw him in Wonka because he's been playing nothing but like these hard, somber, dark roles, right? And then we get to see him in Wonka where he plays a totally different kind of character than we've ever seen him play. And he was fantastic in that. I think if there is only one person in acting today who has the potential to be the next Daniel Day-Lewis, that's Timothy Chalamet. On the actress equivalency would be Meryl Streep. I mean, there's, there's no doubt. Meryl Streep, the street monster, she's it. She's the gold standard. She's whatever. I mean, Florence Pugh is great. I love Florence Pugh. Is she have the potential to be the next Meryl Streep? <clears throat> I think she has the potential to be an amazing actress in Hollywood for many years. The next Meryl Streep? I don't see it. But I don't see it in anybody. Anya Taylor-Joy, fantastic. Can't wait to see her in Furiosa. But she has the potential to be a true great. But does she have the potential to be the next, you know, eight-time, 18-time Oscar-nominated Meryl Streep? I, I, don't, I don't see that. Emma Stone, right? Might win her second Oscar coming up. Do I see her as the next Meryl Streep? Maybe the best of her generation, but I don't see the next Meryl Streep. Honestly, out of everybody in Hollywood today, I right now personally only see one performer who has the potential to be either the next Daniel Day-Lewis or the next Meryl Streep. And the only one person that is, is Timothy Chalamet. And I'm not even saying he's the best actor in the world right now. I'm just saying when you look at how good he is and he's only getting better every time we see him. I just don't think there's another actor alive who has the potential, who has the ceiling that he has. I think he can, he, the potential is there that he could be a Daniel Day-Lewis. I just don't see anybody else in the business right now that has that potential. People saying Austin Butler. Austin Butler's great. I love Austin Butler. Austin Butler is not in the same category as Timothy Chalamet. He's, he's just not. Um, I, and I think he's wonderful. I think Austin Butler's wonderful, but... Uh, yeah, I only see one person having that potential right now. And I, I think that's Timothy Chalamet. Anyway. All right. <clears throat> Next up, we go to an anonymous viewer who writes box office pro was tracking Madam web to open between 25 and 35 million over the three day weekend, Friday to Sunday, but deadline is tracking you to open 25 million over the six day weekend, Valentine's day on Wednesday, when it opens uh, president's day on Monday. Um, I always go with box office pro. I mean, places like, listen, Deadline is very, very legit, Hollywood Report of Variety, but uh, when it comes to the box office projections, they often get close, but I mean, I would always lean more towards Box Office Pro, um, but listen, if this thing opens to $25 million, <laughs> well, look, if Madam Web could open to $35 million, this is a cheaper movie they made, it's conceivable that Madam Web could break even. Maybe, but I, I don't think it'll open a $35 million opening weekend. I'm not here. Like I'm interested in seeing this movie, but I have not heard anybody say they're super excited for it. And I'm sure there are people out there who are super excited for it. I'm sure there are. I, I'm just saying, I personally have not heard anybody say they're super excited for it. I'm going to go see it. I am going to go see it, but yeah, I don't think it's going to make $35 million. All right, next up. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, track writes, finally watched Andor, best thing Star Wars has ever made outside of the original trilogy. Uh, finally watched Andor this weekend and was amazed by how much it sucked me in. One of the best shows I've seen in years and definitely the best Star Wars thing since Rogue One. I uh, wish so many uh, people hadn't been burned by Star Wars and gave it a chance. I, I, I got to tell you, <clears throat> I was absolutely floored by Andor. Star Wars has never made anything as good. I mean, obviously you've got the original trilogy, right? New Hope, Empire, Return of the Jedi. That will always be the gold standard of everything. But out of all the stuff that Star Wars has made since, nothing in my opinion holds a candle to Andor. And I, I love Rogue One. I, I love Rogue One. Um, I also really like The Force Awakens. You know, that, that the new trilogy declined in quality as it went on, but I really liked The Force Awakens, the, the first film. 
Um, I, you know, I love Mandalorian season one. Uh, I really like Rebels, but nothing. I, I remember the first thing I said after I saw it, I was like, this is Star Wars for grownups. That's what and- Andor is, is as if HBO, who makes Succession and all these big, big shows, right? I, I said Andor was if HBO made a Star Wars show. Like it, it was just so good on so many levels. And I cannot wait for it. We're going to talk a little bit about season two, actually, tomorrow. <laughs> um, Skellen Skarsgård uh, just made some comments about it. Can't wait to talk about that. We're going to discuss that a little bit tomorrow. But yeah, Andor is just bloody fantastic, man. First Star Wars. I mean, it was nominated for the top prize in all of television. Best drama series at the Emmys. It didn't win. But it got nominated as like the best of the best. I mean, that that's just incredible. All right. Next up, Anonymous also writes, what's worse, uh, James Gunn hiring a writer with no credits to write Supergirl or Sony hiring the writers of Morbius, God of Egypt, The Last Witch Hunter and Dracula Untold to write Madam Web. The Supergirl writer could be as good as your writer friends. I mean, so it's a little bit different talking about a writer who's got no credits versus a director who had no credits, right? Because a writer, you know, Chris Carr and I had this discussion once and she brought up a really, really good point. She mentioned, you know, a writer could have written 20 fabulous screenplays, right? But if no studio ever decided to spend the money to pick those up and and make those into movies, then technically that writer has no credits. So I like to see a writer with credits, but it's not as daunting to me to see a movie coming up with a writer without any produced credits yet versus a director who's never directed. (coughs) Because a writer may have written 20, 30 great screenplays that just never got produced. Remember, there's one movie gets produced for every like 5,000 screenplays that get written. So it's not good, it's not bad. But I'll tell you what, I, I don't know in a business that has so many talented writers that never get a shot, the person who wrote Morbius, Gods of Egypt, The Last Witch Hunter, and Dracula Untold, how does that person keep getting work? Like, it's cool if you have one or two bad credits, right? Everybody has a bad day at the office, right? And for a writer, maybe you wrote a great screenplay and the directors just didn't make a good movie out of it. That, that happens. Totally that happens. But When you got somebody who has so many, not just bad credits, but like legendarily bad credits, Morbius, Gods of Egypt, Last Witch Hunter, Dracula Untold, how does that? So yeah, the James Gunn thing is neither good nor bad. I've never, we haven't seen this writer have something produced yet, but that doesn't mean they haven't written a ton of stuff. I think it's worse that they got the the people who made all those movies making Madam Web. To me, that's the worst one, but I mean, you know, it's, it's up to everybody. (laughs) <laughs> to decide what's important to them or not. All right. Next up, we got Twilight Boy writes, the first time I smelled trouble with Marvel was when they announced Disney Plus shows. My sister-in-law were, my sister and in-law uh, were both big fans, but not f- fanatics. Once Feige announced all the shows in 2019, they checked out because I don't want to watch shows to see movies. Listen, that has been, not just the biggest problem with Disney Plus, but I think one of the bigger problems with the MCU as a whole. I've talked about this before. One of the keys to Marvel's success in its first like 13 years to becoming the biggest franchise in the history of Hollywood was the fact that every single movie they put out was a valid entry point for a new fan. Marvel never put out a movie in the first 13 plus years where it's like, oh, you want to come see this new Marvel movie? Well, you got to go back and you got to watch this, 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 and this. Never did it. I mean, it would be helpful sometimes if you saw some of the previous movies, but I had a friend, I've told you about this. I got a good friend of mine who the very first Marvel movie they watched was Endgame and they didn't feel lost at all. They didn't feel lost at all. Obviously, you get more out of it if you saw Infinity War, but they, they didn't feel lost. They saw it loved it, and then went back and watched the other stuff. And Marvel was always like that. Until recently, what started happening was that 
they started to give you homework. Like, you just will not understand or get Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness if you didn't see WandaVision. You, you just, you couldn't. You're just going to be sitting in the whole movie. It's like, wait, wait, what? Juan is a bad guy? What? What? what, what huh? Or take the Marvels. Like, who was even going to be interested in going to see the Marvels if you hadn't seen Ms. Marvel and you hadn't seen WandaVision? Because, you know, I talked about, Rob and I discussed this. It's like <clears throat> people watching the trailers and going, oh, I'm clearly behind. Like, it's see, like Guardians of the Galaxy was different because somebody brought up to me, John, nobody knew who Guardians of the Galaxy was and everybody wanted to go see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they made it clear this is a new character. These are new characters, right? These have never been on the movies before. Come and meet the Guardians of the Galaxy. So audience members, even those who had no idea who Guardians of the Galaxy were, they didn't feel like they were already behind. They're like, oh yeah, we're going to go into this because we're all at the starting point. Everybody's at the starting line. Nobody has seen the Guardians yet. These are brand new characters. The Marvel's marketing campaign left audience members feeling like, oh, I'm behind. I'm behind. These trailers make it clear. A lot of other people will know who that girl is and they'll know who that girl is, but I don't. I haven't seen them. I don't know their story. I'm already behind. <clears throat> and Marvel never used to do that, but they're doing it now. And I really hope that um, that now that Kevin Feige has his authority back, I really hope that's one of the main issues and problems that Kevin Feige starts to address and to fix. All right. Next up, we go to Sam Fisher, who writes, Give me an amazing Spider-Man 3 uh, that adapts Spider-Man Blue by Joseph Loeb and Tim Sale when uh, where it's a day or two. You're talking about the one who's doing the thing to uh, like he was recording the stuff for uh, Gwen Stacy a day or two before Peter and Mary Jane's wedding. Uh, we see he is getting cold feet. So he's recording a video messages to a den to a dead Gwen uh, <coughs> uh, as a framing device. Um we then start to see his relationship with MJ in flashbacks while also fighting various villains and Garfield Spider-Man uh, never got to fight. And they can even bring back Shailene Woodley as MJ, uh, as Mary Jane. Sorry, I just thought of this. Instead of doing it as a framing device with flashbacks, do it as a regular love story with Peter and MJ with Peter's narration and then reveal the whole thing has been him recording a video message to Gwen about MJ. Um, <clears throat> no. I don't think so because you got to remember part of the reason. Listen, I love Andrew Garfield Spider Man. I, I think he is my all time. Look, I love Tobey Maguire. I love what Tom Holland's doing with the character. Love him, but Andrew's my favorite. And Spider Man No Way Home really cemented that for me. But a lot of people forget that the whole reason, um, the whole reason that. <clears throat> they moved on and made their partnership with Marvel is because people were abandoning the amazing. Listen, the first amazing Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield, I thought was great. That I thought that was a great movie. The second one with Jamie Foxx's Electro, not so good. And it had declining returns and all that kind of stuff. And, and they abandoned it. I don't think people, I think you'll hear some fans saying, I would love to see another Andrew Garfield movie. Absolutely. I would be there to see it too. But I really don't think as a whole, the overall movie going audience will be there for it. I, I think it, it, it didn't work. They, they moved on from it. And I think you need to continue moving on. And uh, that's, that's just where I'm at. But I mean, the concept is good. I like the concept. I really do. Um, let's see this. Uh, Ethan Holgate writes, uh, hey, John, uh, this has to be the weird, wildest coincidence ever. I laughed when Jonathan referred to the Dune popcorn bucket as the fleshlight. Yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. Uh, as I was listening to that on the live app show, I absolutely, okay. As I was listening to that uh, live episode, I actually happened to be in the middle of cleaning my own fleshlights. Hey, man, you do you. Men's sexual health is very important. And if uh, you like playing with those, 
God bless you, man. Godspeed. All right. Garden Variety Vagabond writes, <clears throat> Taylor goes to the Super Bowl. Oops, I mean the Chiefs go to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, look, I know you're joking, but again, <clears throat> we talked about this on the John Campus show earlier. <clears throat> a, a lot of the Taylor Swift, you know, on the, on the NFL broadcast stuff is such overblown, bullshit, insecure, snowflake little pseudo boys that's also drenched in hypocrisy. Let, let me give you an example. And again, we talked about this on the John Cabe show earlier, but it bears repeating. So CBS literally did a clock. And some of you probably saw this. <laughs> literally did a clock on how much screen time during the Kansas City Chiefs, Baltimore Raven, AFC Championship game. How much time was Taylor Swift actually on screen? The grand total in the three plus hour broadcast was 25 seconds. 25 seconds she was on screen. The, if you listen to some people, they're acting like she was on screen for an hour of the three hour sings. It was literally 25 seconds. Now, when I was watching the San Francisco 49er game, they probably very close to 25 seconds went to Brock Purdy's parents. I don't think it was quite 25 seconds, but they went to Brock Purdy's parents two or three times because Brock Purdy, the quarterback, of the San Francisco 49ers, he'd make a big play and they would naturally want to cut to his parents, right? Showing their parents joy that their kid is on field doing something great, right? Of course, that's natural. You got Travis Kelsey, maybe the great, and as a as a Gronk fan, it hurts me to say, but Travis Kelsey, maybe the best tight end in the history of football, makes some big, unbelievable play, and he made many of them in that game. <clears throat> Forget that it's Taylor Swift. They cut to his world famous biggest pop star on the planet girlfriend for her reaction. It's natural. Then I was watching one of my favorite sports pundits. Um, I, I've got a number of guys that I really, really love following. Michael Wilbon, several guys, right? But um, a Colin Cowherd on Fox Sports. I, I, I love, I've been following Colin Cowherd ever since he was on ESPN. He's over at Fox now. But he made a great point. He said this. He said it's pure hypocrisy. People complaining about Taylor Swift being on screen for 10 seconds is pure hypocrisy. You know why? Because when he's watching his, I can't remember what Texas University it is, you can't go 10 minutes without the camera cutting to Matthew McConaughey, who's always there at their games for his alma mater. You, go, you watch a New York Knicks game? You're not going to be able to, like, guaranteed, at least a number of times in your New York Knicks game, they will cut to the courtside seats, Spike Lee, right? Back in the day, the showtime in the Lakers, if Jack is there, if Jack Nicholson is there sitting in the front row, which he normally was, constantly, camera, go to Jack, right? It happens all the time. Happens all the time. But... The little girly men, boo they're showing a girl. And by the way, Rob and I were talking about this off camera a little bit earlier too. Like if they were literally going to, to Taylor Swift for like five or 10 minutes of the broadcast, I would get annoyed. I would get annoyed if they were doing that for anybody, right? Anybody. It was 25 seconds in total time. But boo it's a girl. Oh no. And let's be honest. Let's call it what it is. Can we? Can, can we just be honest and, and, and call it what it is? All right. There are certain people on the political spectrum, not to make this about politics, but I'm not making this. This is them. This is them saying this explicitly. Okay. I'm not making it up. I'm, this is not a judgment call from me. I'm saying these people themselves will outright say this. So I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth. This is outright say it. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who simply because 
they don't like the Travis Kelsey Taylor Swift thing, and they have. I'm only saying this because I've heard, they say this out loud. Because Travis Kelsey endorses getting vaccinated, and Taylor Swift is not a fan of a particular individual running for president. That's it. I'm not saying that's what it is for everybody. Not at all. I've, there are certain people who like or dislike certain. People. That's fine. But let's 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 just call. Well, let's just be honest about it. <clears throat> let's just be honest about it. That's the basis for probably a good amount of the people who are whining and complaining about it. <clears throat> just is what it is, you know. But again, for the people, like, yeah, I just uh, Colin Cowherd purry this out. I just do, I do not watch football. I just watch football. I don't want to see celebrities in the stands. That's funny. Nobody was complaining when they show Matthew McConaughey or they show Spike Lee or show Jack. Everybody thinks that's the coolest thing in the world. Oh, but it's Taylor Swift. So you're going to cry about it. I don't give a shit about Taylor Swift. I love the Kelsey brothers. The Kelsey brothers, I love. I'm a big fan of the Kelsey brothers, particularly Jason Kelsey. But I don't give a shit about Taylor Swift. But... <laughs> Oh, my butt hurts because they showed one of the star football players' girlfriends in the stands for 25 seconds. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, it's just, it's freaking hilarious and sad that the state, that men can't be masculine anymore. Men are just pussies now. And it just, uh, it's, it's frustrating. Anyway, that being said, let's move on here. Um, that was a uh, guard, right? Yeah. Uh, the chicken nugget says, how about those chiefs? Listen, the chiefs are not that good this year. They're just not. Um, and Baltimore choked Baltimore. Absolutely choked the Kansas city chiefs only scored 17 points in their AFC championship game. If it wasn't for the fact that Baltimore completely and utterly choked, they would be in the Super Bowl. But uh, Kansas is in there. And listen, uh, any team that has Patrick Mahomes playing quarterback always has a chance to win. He is truly a generational talent. And anytime he takes the field, no matter how stacked the odds are against them, never count them out. That said, uh I think the uh, 49ers should beat them. And I'll actually say, I think they should beat them by 14 points. They should. What'll happen? That's why you play the game. As Al Pacino once said, any given Sunday, right? So we'll see what happens there. All right. And now it's your rights. Hey, John crew. Did you watch the beekeeper? I still have not seen it. And I love Jason Statham, and I want to see this movie, but I still haven't had a chance to go see it. Uh, if so, what did you think of it? I personally felt that it was very entertaining, and the fight choreography was phenomenal. It's doing great at the box office, and I'm looking forward to a sequel. I would not say it's doing great at the box office. I don't think that's true. Let me go see here. Beekeeper. <coughs> um, it's made $122 million at the box office. I would not say that is doing great. At the box office. Now, it, I'm sure this was a this was a, a a reasonable and modest budget to make this movie. So maybe from a business point of view, it's doing pretty good. But I, nobody's gone to see it. It's made 122 million. That means nobody has gone to see it, right? Um, and I love Jason Statham. Love, love, love. I'm a I'm a completely unapologetic big Jason Statham fan. But I wouldn't say it's doing great. Anyway glad to hear that people are liking it you're not the only one who's written in to tell me that they've really liked it and i am still looking forward to seeing it i just <clears throat> you know between being a little bit under the weather uh the weather itself i don't know if you guys saw in the news southern california is getting hammered right now with the uh, the huge storm um and uh trying to go to meet the sons of anarchy and all that kind of stuff i still have not had a chance to go see it yet and i really do because i love me some jason statham all right Next up, <clears throat> Garden Variety Vagabond writes, seeing the Nielsen list for the most streamed movies in 2023, it also has another clear trend. Uh, most are kid-friendly films. Yeah, a lot of them are. So I would additionally ask, what made the others rise to the top? Knives Out especially stands out as it was not a part of Marvel, etc. Yeah, let me see. <clears throat> I'm not sure I've got it right on hand, but let me see if I can pull this up. So 
One of the stories that we covered on uh, the John Campia show, I believe it was last week. And, and again, let me see if I can find it here. I'm not sure I can. But was the fact that Nielsen put out their big list. And again, let me see if I can find it because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find it. Of what were the most streamed TV shows and what were the most streamed movies? Here we go. TV shows and most streamed movies of 2023. And we'll go over and take a look at this here. One of the really interesting things was that not a single one of these movies in, in this world where everything's going to be streaming now, everything's going to be streaming. Not a single movie, not one on the top 10 was a streaming exclusive movie. Every single movie on the list got a theatrical release first. Moana number one, Encanto number two. So this is a very good list for Disney+. Plus. Uh, Super Mario Brothers, Elemental, Minions, Sing 2, Frozen, Black Panther, Avatar the Way of Water, and Knives Out, uh, uh, Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery was in the number 10 spot. So <laughs> you're right. On streaming, it makes sense that a lot of the um, stuff that we get will be kid and family friendly. I mean, that's the stuff that families like to stream at home. So you got your Moana, Encanto, um, Super Mario Brothers, Elemental. By the way, Elemental is a wonderful film. If you haven't seen Elemental yet, watch it. It's a really wonderful film. Minions Sing 2 Frozen. It's not until you get down to the bottom of the list with Black Panther, Avatar, and uh, Knives Out. Avatar, well, I mean, it's the third biggest film of all time. So it stands to reason that it would make that list. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Again, that was close to a billion dollar film it didn't quite hit the billion dollar mark but it got close to the billion dollar film of course the first film was completely beloved i think a lot of people took a pass on it in theaters because it wasn't chadwick boseman anymore so they waited for it on streaming and knives out i, I mean I, people loved Ni glass uh, knives out knives out was great glass onion was also really really good and the fact that um they did a theatrical then they put a, this big deal about making it a theatrical release for one or two weeks and then really pumped it, then going to Netflix, and that did really well for it. So I think you're right. I think the family-friendly stuff will always kind of take the lead in the streaming stuff. Then it'll become a matter of, like, what's the thing that pushes those other films up and over the top? I think just how they manage their marketing campaign and, you know, just being really huge. I think that kind of helps there, too. It's a good question, man. Great question. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> Next up, we've got... That was Garden Variety. Garden Variety writes again, one of two. Um, loop mentioning? Anyway, Bryce Dallas Howard was on the British Graham Norton show. What have you learned from your father about directing? She, of course, her, Bryce Dallas Har Howard's father is the great Ron Howard. Uh, she told the story from being a kid on set of The Grinch with Jim, John Kerry. I'm sure you mean Jim Kerry. Uh, he would be in the chair for eight hours for makeup. <coughs> uh, one morning... Jim Carrey arrived to find her dad in the director's chair in the full makeup himself. He worked the whole day in the makeup. She was moved by how her father respected the actors and what they went through. It has stayed with her. I have never heard that story. That Ron Howard himself got in the makeup so he could go through the eight hour of makeup time so he could relate with Jim Carrey having to go through that every day. I tell you what, Ron Howard is one of my favorite directors. I mean, he's not not in my top five, but I love Ron Howard. My personal favorite Ron Howard movie is still Backdraft with Kurt Russell. You go, we go. One of the most grr, manly moments ever in a film. You go, we go. I, if you guys haven't seen Backdraft with Kurt Russell, watch it. It's amazing. I love that movie so much. Anyway, uh, but that's a little story. I've never heard that story before, Garden Variety. That I, I'm with you. That just makes me respect him even more. I think that's great. All right, guys, listen. We still have more questions to get through here, so we still got a, a whole bunch of time left. But we're going to take a quick moment here. I'm going to rest my voice for a minute. I'm going to go refill my drink. I'm probably going to pop open one of these halls and give you guys a chance to run, use the bathroom, talk amongst yourselves. We're going to take a minute and hear from a couple of sponsors of today's episode of Open Mic. My mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint and the great folks at Masterclass. 
Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash camp. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's episode, Masterclass. Everyone, it's a new year. So picture that thing that you've always wanted to learn. Now, picture learning it from a person who's literally one of the best in the world at it. And that's what you get with Masterclass. This year, learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass. Don't just talk about improving. Masterclass helps you actually do it. Because Masterclass offers over 180 world-class instructors. So whether you want to master negotiation with Chris Voss, like I did, think like a boss with Martha Stewart, or learn the art of storytelling from the man himself, Neil Gaiman. Masterclass has you covered. Because with Masterclass, you get unlimited access to intimate one-on-one -on -one classes with the world world's best. At Masterclass, there are over 200 classes to pick from, with new classes being added every month. And if you're a viewer of The John Campus Show, you probably love movie making, storytelling, television. So you'd be totally interested in things like screenwriting from Aaron Sorkin, learn developing original TV series from Stranger Things' as The Duffer Brothers, or maybe you like the music side of movies, well, you can learn film scoring from Hans Zimmer. And right now, our listeners will get an additional 15% off an annual membership at Masterclass masterclass.com slash campia. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash campia. Masterclass.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Mint and Masterclass for sponsoring today's episode of Open Mic. All right, guys, with that down, let's get back over to the questions here, shall we? We're going to pick things up here with Narf, who writes, fun fact, the last AFC Championship game to not feature the Patriots or the Chiefs was 2011 Steelers versus Jets. Yeah, this, and and most of those were the Patriots. Most of the the uh, the Chiefs have had a big big run too. But yeah, that is kind of crazy. The last time, did you know? Here's another interesting fact. They said I think it was like 22 percent of all Super Bowls. I think they said 22 percent of all Super Bowls have had Tom Brady in it. <laughs> How crazy is that? Anyway, all right. Next up, we go to Garden Variety Vagabond writes, one of nine. Okay, everybody buckle up. Alan Richens, of course, he's in the new Reacher show, and he was Aquaman in, in Smallville. Uh, Alan Richens' life has totally impressed me. Let's face it, he's not like the rest of us humans. He started out on American Idol and was depicted as eye candy for Paula Abdul. The man is talented, huge, and handsome in a way that we can only dream. Uh, but he was very open in an interview with Michael Rosenbaum on his Inside You podcast. That's a great podcast, by the way. You should listen to Michael Rosenbaum. Um, it is a must-see. He discusses his struggles with physical and mental health as an actor. He started to gain success. It was not what it seemed to be. Uh, on the one hand, he struggled with being a blue collar guy, being tempted by starlets while he had a wife and kids and he was reaching greater and greater success. He had pushed himself into a manic phase to try to meet all of his responsibilities. Um, he was being threatened by a female business partner with false accusations and it led him to attempt to kill himself by hanging, but it failed. He felt that he was doing his family a favor by ending his life during filming of season one of Reacher. Uh, the producers, knowing that he had ongoing mental health issues, had an assistant whose job was to observe him. Oh, that's very responsible of them. And be a soundboard if they were seeing uh, his issues of deep depression or his bipolar struggles. He said it was a very it was very difficult filming. Um, I don't want to complain, 
but it was the most challenging shoot I've ever had to endure, and it just about killed me. The filming was so tight due to budget constraints, they at first wanted him to film seven days a week, but it got reduced to six. Uh, still caused him to have multiple major injuries and required for him to work under strong painkillers. Wow. He stated that uh, he was literally close to death in several episodes, and he can see it when he rewatches them. Uh, on a more positive note, the character of Reacher has impacted him as a person. In an interview with eTalk, he described uh, how, while on a date with his wife in Montreal, good Canadian city, uh, they saw a man break into a car and to start to get away with someone's stuff. Uh, and yes, typing a message out in Microsoft Word and using a letter character count to ensure that it just definitely fits the tips. Anyway, um, that's amazing stuff. You know, one of the things that I really like about Michael Rosenbaum's um, uh, Michael Rosenbaum's uh, podcast, which I, again, the Inside of You podcast, is not just a great name. It, it, I mean, it's a it's a great it's a great podcast, right? One of the great things about that podcast is that he definitely he has this ability to definitely go beyond what are the the basic standard fluff question and answer stuff that a lot of people do with celebrities. But at the same time, he's incredibly good at keeping it very respectful. You know, he'll get into deep stuff, but he makes sure he doesn't cross certain lines. And he never puts his guests in a position where they're going to feel really awkward or uncomfortable or whatever. And he really, he's very, very good at just kind of leading the discussion and just kind of letting the talent talk about things that they want to talk about. And that's one of the reasons, like his, his interview with James Gunn was fantastic. Obviously, whenever he does stuff with his old Smallville uh, crew is always great. I mean, he's just a really, really good. And anyway, so Hearing, I didn't see this episode with Alan, but hearing him telling those types of stories, I'm not surprised because uh, Rosenbaum just makes a, a really good environment for people to do that. <laughs> but I think I might have mentioned this before. I won't say who, but one of the people who were on one of my staffs, I won't say whether it was AMC, Collider, the John Campbell show. I'll just say one of the people who was on one of my staffs, and there have been many actually dated Michael Rosenbaum for a while. Just throwing that out there. Um, I don't think they liked Michael Rosenbaum very much, but I love Michael Rosenbaum. And I think he hosts a terrific podcast. Absolutely terrific. Anyway, garden. Thanks a lot for sending that in. All right, guys. Um, now there are still more questions to go in the uh from the tip links but we don't have time to get through all of them so we're gonna we're gonna cover up if you sent in a question via the tip link and we didn't get to it today come on back tomorrow we'll make sure we get all cut up tomorrow there's still a bunch there but we are we're not we don't have to end real soon but we're getting we're more than halfway through half of our time and i gotta move over and start taking questions from the facts from the people who've been sending in questions via the super chat. So let's go over and do that now, shall we? So we'll get things picked up here with Kyle, uh, who writes, uh, I saw a lot of movies that I hated this year. The Meg 2, Fast X, Expendables 4, to name a few. I hated all those movies too. Um, I think Argyle might actually been worse than all three. Um... Our guy was bad. Our guy was so bad. Um, and and again, I, I mentioned this this morning on the John Campbell show, but I am such a big fan of Matthew Vaughn. And you guys know how much I love Henry Cavill. I love Bryce Dallas Howard. I love Sam Rockwell. I love Brian Cranston. Um, but the movie was just bad. Now, now here's, here's the hope. If you like... Kingsman 2, which I love the first Kingsman. I hate Kingsman 2. But if you're the type of person that you enjoyed Kingsman 2, Argyle may be for you. 
And I don't say that facetious. I mean, honestly, like we all like different things, right? Movies are subjective. But if Kingsman 2 was the kind of movie that really worked for you, I think Argyle is something that you'll enjoy. So I would recommend checking it out. But yeah, I, I, I really, I was so disappointed with Argyle. I thought it was so bad. I was very excited about the movie ending so I could leave. Uh, but yeah, hey, you know what? Whatever, whatever. That's, uh, that's just me. That's just me. All right, next up, we go to, uh, did you see the new 2024 CinemaCon schedule? I did. Uh, CinemaCon is coming up. Very excited about it. Cannot wait to go. Um, I mean, we heard that Sony had backed out of this year. And like somebody wrote in and said, oh, Sony backed out of CinemaCon. Oh, no, oh, no. But the reality is, I feel like Every year at CinemaCon for the last four or five years, at least one of the studios doesn't go. All right. And it can be for a lot of different reasons. But like, you know, Disney didn't go one year. Um, I think Warner Brothers didn't go one year. Sony's not going. It's, it's not a big deal. I said, now if like three or four studios back out at the same time, that could become an issue. But the schedule came out. All the studios are going other than Sony. And I'm sure Sony will be back. Sony is a big CinemaCon studio. They love CinemaCon, all that kind of stuff. But it feels like every year, like one studio doesn't go. <coughs> Three screenings um, are in the schedule. So I don't know what they're all going to be. Um, I know Rob still is hell bent believing that Deadpool 3 is going to be one of the screenings. I think it's too early for them to show Deadpool 3, even at CinemaCon. So I don't think it'll be Deadpool 3. But, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, all the other studios doing big, big, big two hour long presentations. It's my favorite. CinemaCon is my favorite event of the year in, in the, in the industry is my fa I, th I like it more than Comic-Con. I mean, I think, I just think CinemaCon is so great and I love going to it. I don't miss it. And I cannot wait to go again this year. All right. Next up, we got, um, Sanchez guy, 002 who writes, I didn't watch Argyle, but I did watch the Netflix movie DreamWorks Orion in the Dark, and it was good. You should give it a try. I've never even heard of this movie. Any of you guys in the live chat know this film or any of you guys in the live chat familiar with this movie? I am not familiar with it at all. I, I have no knowledge of this movie whatsoever. So if any of you guys know it, uh, please jump in the live chat and let me know that you know this movie because I am not familiar with this thing at all. All right. Uh, next up, we go to uh, Donaldo Martinez writes, have you seen the trailer? Uh, where'd it go? Oh yeah. Have you seen the trailer for the new Netflix series called House of Ninjas? It looks really good. It looks really good. Okay. So, um, Here's, I was sitting at my desk last week and I get this text message from Rob. I'm going to see if I can pull it up here. I get this text message from Rob and uh, yeah, face ID. There we go. Let me see if I can find this one. Where's Rob? There's Rob. Um, yeah, it's going to be difficult for you to see this. But I'll try to see if you can get it. There it is. House of Ninjas. And him writing, dude, what do I always say? And of course, the thing Rob always says is, Any ninjas makes everything better. So he's just, he's just frantically texting me about this ninjas trailer. So I'm like, all right, let's check it out. And I got to tell you, I am on board. <laughs> Mark me down. Check me as a yes. I am 100% on board for this house of ninjas. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be, um, it's going to be subtitled. It's in Japanese, but I mean, you just, if you guys haven't seen the trailer, like there's literally a family of ninjas that like work for the government to protect the government, protect the country. And then they go, he goes into retirement, right? This big, bad main ninja dude, he goes into retirement. He's got a family now and all this kind of stuff. And like the government comes back to him. 
there's a new ninja threat. We need you to come back and be a ninja again to protect the thing. It's like, no, I'm going to protect my family. I'm not going to put my family because it looks like the trailer makes it look like he lost one of his sons or something like that. It's like, we're well, going to protect my family. You understand me? But clearly something's going to bring him back and him and his kids and his wife's kind of like the Incredibles. That's honestly what it is. It's, it's Incredibles, but with ninjas instead of superheroes, right? And there's this great scene of like one of the son is like working in a convenience store and to stock a soda machine. He's standing like 15 feet away from it, but he's throwing the cans of soda and they're just going exactly into the right slots. Right. Anyway, sign me up. I cannot wait to watch this. I think it's going to be awesome. All right, guys, listen, we got a, a few more questions to get through here, but we're going to take another quick break here and. Thank another sponsor of today's episode of Open Mic. You got the Super Bowl coming up, so we're going to be talking about our friends at DraftKings. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, DraftKings. DraftKings, the leader in fantasy sports, just dropped a brand new app, Pick 6. Pick 6 is the newest way for you to get in on the fantasy football action with DraftKings. New customers can make their first NFL picks and get up to 100 bucks in Pick 6 credits if those picks lose. All you got to do is pick between two and six NFL players and choose if they're going to have more or less of that stat. For example, will a player have more or less than 100 rushing yards or will a player have more or less than one touchdown. Track your lineup and compete against others for a shot at huge cash prizes. So download the DraftKings Pick 6 app now and sign up with the code CAMPIA. New customers can get up to 100 bucks back in Pick 6 credits if your first football pick set loses. That's code CAMPIA only on DraftKings Pick 6. One offer per new customer. First qualifying pick set winnings less entry fees must generate negative number. Max reward up to $100 equal to amount of negative number. Issued in non-withdrawable pick six credits. Valid for pick six use only. Expire after one year. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 18 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. Valid only in states where DraftKings pick six operates. Pick six not available in all states, including but not limited to Connecticut and New York. For up-to-date list of states, please visit dkng.co slash pick six states. Void were prohibited. See terms and pick six dot draftkings dot com. And thank you to our friends at DraftKings for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, let's get back over to your questions here, shall we? We're going to pick things up again with Donaldo Martinez again, who writes, I finally watched Blue-Eyed Samurai. Oh, my God, that show's so good. Uh, binge the entire season in a day. It was really good. I couldn't stop. Dude, I, I'm right there with you. You know, I was not interested in Blue-Eyed Samurai. It sounded like some little kitty show. Um, not really interested, but then one night, Anne was going out with some of our girlfriends, and like, I was like, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll, I had a bunch of the viewers write in and say that they thought blue eyed samurai was really good. So I'm like, all right, I binged the whole show. Like Anne got home and she's like, Hey, you want to go out and get a dessert or something? I'm like, nah, baby, I can't. I'm watching this blue eyed samurai. I got, I got to finish it. I can't, I can't, I can't go anywhere. Sorry, baby. I got to stay here. And she's like, okay, fine. She was a little irritated with me, I think. But anyway, so I was floored by how good this show was. I mean, it, I didn't like it as much as Arcane. Arcane is still like the greatest animated show I think I've ever seen. But Blue-Eyed Samurai, if you've not checked it out, I highly recommend you guys give it a shot. It's really, really good. It, it's really top-notch stuff. I enjoyed it a lot. All right. Uh, next up. And it's on Netflix for those. I, yeah. Right? Guys in the live chat, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think it's on Netflix. So it's uh, there. All the episodes are there. Go check it out. All right. Next up. Kyle Schneider writes. I think the mystery screening is Lisa Frankenstein. Yeah, because I heard it's like it's, it's a horror one. And like some of the other like there's some horror movies coming out like and not Annabelle, the one about the little girl vampire. I can't remember the name of that one. That's coming out. I'm very excited about that little girl vampire one. Again, I can't remember the name of it. it the name of the movie is the name of the girl. But uh, I got to th I think you're right. I think Lisa Frankenstein is probably the, the mystery screening coming up. All right, next up, John Redcorn writes, when will we get a Bad Boys 4 trailer? It's got to be soon. Oh, Abigail. Abigail. That's the name of the little vampire girl. That, I believe the movie's supposed to come out in June. So we're in February, March, April, May, June. So we're like four months out. Now, I don't think, I don't think personally that we're going to get a trailer for it at the Super Bowl. Uh, I, I don't think they're going to spend that much money for one spot at Super Bowl. I, I just don't think they're going to do it. I mean, they could. 
but I don't think they're going to do it. But it's got to, they could drop it online around the time of the Super Bowl to try to blend in with all the Super Bowl ads. Uh, that's a pun. I mean, I, I've seen, more and more we're seeing movies wait until like they're only three months out to start dropping. But I think, yeah, four months, it's got to be soon. It's got to be soon. All right, next up. We go to uh, Schickster, who writes, thinking of switching to ad-supported streaming, but no one ever says how many commercials there are. One, five, four, uh, 10 minutes, movies, any info will help. You know what? That is a great question, but I honestly don't know. I, 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 sim I simply don't know. Now, I believe I heard, and anybody who is watching right now that uses like the ad supported tier on Netflix or on Disney Plus, I'd love for you to chime in here. From what I heard, it's really not a lot like compared to traditional television, right? Like traditional television, 30 minute episodes, the actual episode length is like 22 and a half minutes. That means seven and a half minutes out of 30 minutes are commercials. That's the traditional television model, right? <clears throat> I, From what I heard, it's not going to be anywhere close to that. Like I heard it's going to be a lot less than that. Now, as far as asking about whether it'll be in movies, yes, it will be in the movies too. But that's fine. Our natural viewing habits is that we all take breaks from when we're watching movies at home. I just did a video about that. Like studies have shown that 86% of people who watch a movie at home, either on physical media or streaming, will take one or multiple breaks during watching a movie at home. They'll hit pause to either use the bathroom, grab a snack out of the kitchen, answer a text message, something like that. So I don't have a problem that they're going to show them in the movies as well. Um, but yeah, so so I don't know, but it's a good question. I, I, I have no experience with it. I always get the ad free stuff. I'm just kind of spoiled that way, I guess. But I've heard it's not going to be too terribly bad. Certainly nowhere near as bad as broadcast television. So we'll see. Great question there, man. All right, next up, we got Bright who writes, based on your insider knowledge, do you have any Marvel movie slash plot that you wish they had executed? Example, Edgar Wright's Ant-Man, Derrickson's Doctor Strange 2. No, listen, I. here's the interesting thing. Everybody knows how much I love Edgar Wright. OK, Edgar Wright was my guest. He he's one of the celebrities who came on and was a guest on one of my panels at Comic-Con one year. Uh, he was at our he was at the party I threw. I gave him a AMC Fan Fanatics Award. He brought his whole cast of Scott Pilgrim to my party. I clearly have a massive love for Edgar Wright. Um, I love the dude. But, you know, the thing is. The first Ant-Man movie directed by Peyton Reed is, is great. I love that movie. But as much as I love Edgar Wright, the reality was they announced Edgar Wright's Ant-Man movie. And then years and years and years and years passed and the MCU got rolling and the MCU started to develop its identity. And what happened was, you know, Kevin Feige was just realizing the movie that he had wanted Edgar Wright to do, the movie that Edgar Wright wanted to do was a great idea, but it no longer fit with the identity of the MCU. It didn't fit in the MCU anymore. As the MCU got rolling and started to develop its identity, he realized that's a great movie, but it doesn't fit this. And Edgar Wright, understandably, was like, but I don't want to change it because this is the movie I wanted to do. I didn't want to do another movie just because it fits in with the MCU. This is the movie that I pitched. This is the movie that I want to do. So it was one of those situations where I think it was totally reasonable that Kevin Feige said that Ant-Man movie doesn't fit in our MCU anymore. And I also think it was totally reasonable for Edgar Wright to say, well, then I'm not going to direct it because this is the movie that I wanted to do. Um, so... <clears throat> I think it's just one of those really good situations as far as, you know, movies that they were going to do that they didn't end up doing or plot lines or whatever. I'm sure there's one or two, but I, I I'm sitting here just trying to think off the top of my head. I can't think of any off the top of my head. 
the Toby Maguire one. Um, Toby Maguire doing um, what? What was it? Yeah, Spider Man Four. Uh, John Malkovich was going to be in that. They really got him, and then out of nowhere, they canceled it. Now I can't be too angry about that because we ended up getting the first Andrew Garfield, the amazing Spider-Man. And I thought that movie was fantastic. So I can't feel too bad about that, but yeah, it's a good question. All right. Next up, we got John Redcorn who writes bigger opening Dune or Godzilla versus Kong. I say Godzilla versus Kong. I think Dune, because if I'm not mistaken, I'm almost 100%. <laughs> Let's go back over to uh box office mojo here. I'm almost, I'm a, almost hundred percent that Dune made more, Dune 1 made more on its opening weekend than Godzilla vs. Kong did. But let's go, let's check out Dune. Uh, Dune made, I think, $40 million opening weekend. It made 41. $41 million on its opening weekend. Um, uh, God, oh, it's right there. Godzilla vs. Kong, I think, made like 30-something. Godzilla vs. Kong made $31 million. So, yeah. <clears throat> So the first Dune made 25% more on its opening weekend than Godzilla versus Kong made on its opening weekend. What happened since then? Dune went on to win six Academy Awards. And some people like me loved Godzilla versus Kong. Some people did not love Godzilla versus Kong. So <laughs> with that up in there, my guess would be that I think Dune will make more money opening weekend. Because that, that's the question, right? The question is, yeah, what makes the bigger opening, Dune or Godzilla versus Kong? Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, the first Dune made 25% more than Godzilla versus Kong did on its opening weekend. And I don't see anything that suggests Godzilla versus Kong has like increased in hype and excitement for people since then. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't see it, it happening. Um, somebody in the live chat is saying, uh, Godzilla versus or Dune barely made back its budget. Well, yeah, of course it barely made back its budget because Warner brothers released it day and date, uh, on max. So, I mean, clearly it, it barely broke back its budget because Warner brothers under the ownership of AT&T completely sabotaged the movie. Uh, which could have made maybe, I'm not going to say double, but maybe probably made another 40, 50% uh, from what it, from what it made. So yeah, I, I mean, that's always one of the things you got to keep in mind about Dune and, and what happened there with that. Anyway, next up, uh, Chino writes, I want Feige to approve the trailer first. I, Feige will approve the trailer first. I mean, trailers go through Feige. He gives the final approval for trailers going out. So he definitely will. That doesn't automatically mean it'll be great, but there will be that little bit of QC there. <clears throat> uh, YT Pump Life writes, over under 50% they show Deadpool at CinemaCon. 100% that they will show us clips. 100% certainty that they will show us clips. Zero doubt that they will show us clips. Over or under 50% that they show us the full movie. At best, I think it's 10%. Now, Rob will tell you it's 80%. I think at best, it's 10%. The movie is just too far away. Like that, the year that they showed us Shang-Chi, right? <clears throat> at CinemaCon a couple of years, they showed us the full movie of Shang-Chi. But Shang-Chi was only like two weeks away from opening, right? And it was great. It was awesome that they did that. But still, the movie was only like two weeks away from opening. This movie is still going to be like, <clears throat> by the time CinemaCon gets here, the movie is still going to be like three months away. So while I hope they show us Deadpool in its entirety... And I am 100% sure they will definitely show us clips. Them actually showing us the full movie, I think is a very, very slim chance. I think a very, very slim chance they show us. Above, I think it would be awesome if they did. Uh, okay, Chubbs writes, 
I wasn't sure on buying the new Suicide Squad game. Good thing there was a compiled story cut on YouTube, but isn't it stealing if I didn't buy the game? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Look, I'm very, very, very against piracy. You know that. Like, piracy nearly destroyed my friend John Schnepp. Piracy very nearly destroyed him. Um, and many of you guys remember John Schnepp and love John Schnepp. And people who pirate stuff very nearly destroyed his life. And so I feel very strongly um, about, about piracy and stuff like that. It, uh, whatever. But games are, are items that are there to be played, right? To be played, you play the game. I don't think watching a cutscene movie of it is at all because you are not playing the game. It's like, I didn't buy that Ferrari, but I'm going to stand on the sidewalk outside of the dealership and look at the Ferrari. Well, that's, 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 that, that's not the same thing. The, the car is to be driven. The car is to get in and turn the key and drive the car. Standing there looking at the car, I, I, I don't consider that piracy. The intent of the, of the game is gameplay, is to sit down and play the game. You buy it, you play the game. I don't think watching cutscenes from a game is at all the same thing because that's not the the intended usage of the game itself. It's meant to be played and you're not playing it. Now, if you steal the game and play the game, I think that's piracy. I, I mean, look, maybe it's, a, maybe it's an issue of semantics. Maybe I'm wrong about that. that that's, but you're asking me right now, my initial reaction is to say, I don't think it's the same thing. I, I don't think it's remotely the same thing, but I don't know. Maybe I'll have a different opinion. Maybe you can change my mind um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. Next up, we got John Redcorn who writes, Thoughts on the rock backlash from him potentially stealing the WrestleMania main event from Cody Rhodes because he wanted to quote unquote save mania selfish. No, I, I, we talked about this a little bit before on the John Campy show earlier. I think if you've got half a brain, you understand this would be the right move for them. And I'll tell you why. And, and like we talked about on the John Campy show earlier, but let me say again, why <coughs> as it was explained to me, you guys know that now WrestleMania is no longer a one night event. WrestleMania is a two night event, which means you got to have a big headline for night one and a big headline fight for night two, right? The plan for WrestleMania was that CM Punk was going to fight. Uh, what's, what's the guy's name? He used to be in shield with Roman Reigns. What's that guy's name now? Somebody help me out uh, in the live chat for any of you. Seth Rollins. Thank you, Michael Gonzalez. Seth Rollins. Um, so the plan was that CM Punk was supposed to fight Seth Rollins as the main headline fight for night one. And then Cody Rhodes was going to fight Roman Reigns, which they just did last year. So why are they doing it again? Anyway, Cody Rhodes was supposed to fight Roman Reigns for the title as the main headline fight of night two. <clears throat> okay. Sam Punk versus Seth Rollins in night one, big headline fight. Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns night two. The problem was, <clears throat> as I understand it, CM Punk got injured. He's, he's seriously injured and he can't perform at WrestleMania. So <clears throat> you are now left with needing a big match for night one. Okay. They've already had Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins feuding a bit. That's got a lot of heat. So they move Cody Rhodes over to the headline of night one to fight Seth Rollins and have Roman Reigns's cousin, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, come in and do the headline on night two. You have to be a moron not to see the logic in that. Because just bringing in Dwayne Johnson, who is the big draw, he's the draw, just popping Dwayne Johnson on against Seth Rollins, there's, there's no storyline there, right? There's no logic to that. But Dwayne The Rock Johnson versus like the king of his era fighting the current king of this era, era who is his little cousin, Roman Reigns, that is a much more sellable 
um, headline than Dwayne Johnson versus Seth Rollins. That's not a sellable headline. And guess what? It doesn't matter. <clears throat> because in, in next month or in two months or in three months, they can just give Cody Rhodes the heavyweight title later. It doesn't matter. So it, if, if you put, if anybody puts their little fanboyness aside, and I admittedly, sometimes when it comes to movies, TV shows, sports, I admittedly sometimes have a hard time putting my fanboyishness aside. I do. But I think if anybody else will just put their little fanboyishness aside and look at it from a pure marketing business decision, this make this is the right decision. Sorry, it is. It's the right decision. And the only argument anybody has to come back to me, Cody deserves it. I don't, I don't give a shit. This is the right business decision. Cody versus Seth Rollins is a great night one headliner. Rock versus his little baby cousin, who's the current champion, that is a great night two headliner. And then you give Cody his due a little bit later. It's no big deal. This is the right move. Anybody else who tells you any differently either doesn't understand business in the least or is only speaking from their fanboy heart, which I admit I am guilty of doing too. I'm not pointing fingers in judgment. I do it all the time. I think most of us do. But I think if you sit back and look at it, like objectively, this is the right decision. It just is. So the grownups are going to make the decision that this is the right decision. And then <laughs> there are going to be some fans who get up, who get butthurt by it. Sure. But here's the reality. And I'm sorry, this is the truth. WrestleMania is going to get a lot more pay-per-view buys. It just is. Now that Dwayne Johnson is fighting for the heavyweight title. It is going to sell more pay-per-view buys than if they just ran back last year's WrestleMania have Cody fighting Roman Reigns again. But Cody deserves it. He's earned. I get that. I get that. That's, that's fine. That's fine. But nobody can look at themselves in the mirror and say with a straight face that, well, this won't sell as many pay-per-views if Cody was. In. Of course it will. Of course it will. So it's a hundred percent, the right decision. And it kind of sucks that, you know, for, for fans of Cody Rhodes, that he's not going to get his WWE heavyweight title or whatever. They can do that later. They can do that literally one week later at the very next television broadcast. Cody Rhodes can walk in the ring and beat whoever has the title and become the champion again. It's fine. And he's still going to headlight one. Of, he's still going to headline one of the nights at WrestleMania. So yeah, it is what it is. And it's not selfish. Sean Redcorn. It is what is best for the business. He's one of the board members now of this business. It is absolutely what is best for this business. He's kind of saving WrestleMania. So, and again, if CM Punk hadn't been injured, it would have been a totally different story. But with CM Punk getting injured, this is the only, this is the only logical thing to do. This is the only logical thing to do. So it's hundred percent the right decision on their part. All right. <clears throat> Not like I'm some expert in wrestling. Uh, Gopala writes, rewatch the Adam project. It's so good. And I hope Sean Levy brings the heart to Deadpool three. I'll tell you what I look, you know, I love Ryan Reynolds. He's my number one favorite movie star. Good Canadian kid. He is the main sponsor of the John Campia show. I love Ryan Reynolds, but I was a little bit nervous going into the Adam project because it was number one. It was a straight to Netflix movie, not a very good track record. And number two, I'm not a big fan. Like, I know I shouldn't be saying this because Ryan is literally the main sponsor of my show, but I got to tell you the truth. I am not a fan of the previous two straight to Netflix movies that Ryan Reynolds has done. Not that it was Ryan Reynolds' fault. But like Red Notice, which also had Dwayne The Rock Johnson in it, and I love Dwayne The Rock Johnson, but that movie was terrible. Finding out if our sponsors have just canceled on us now. But that movie was terrible. And then he did that Michael Bay movie. <coughs> that Michael Bay straight to, I can't, Six Underground. That's what it was called, right? Six Underground? Six Underground, again, 
Ryan was great in it, but Six Underground was terrible. Again, I'm just looking around for the big scissors of sponsors canceling their sponsorship. Hey, and I'm sorry. You guys, I always tell you guys my honest opinion, whether you like my opinion or not, whether my sponsors like my opinion or not. And I'm a big Ryan Reynolds fan. But those previous two straight to Netflix Ryan Reynolds movies, I'm not a fan of. Somebody in live chat is mentioning Free Guy. Free Guy was not a straight to Netflix movie. Free Guy was a theatrical movie. And that movie was awesome. Uh, also directed by Sean Levy. That movie's fantastic. Love that movie. Now, <clears throat> so I was a little bit nervous with the Adam Project. Because I'll be honest, I didn't think the trailers looked great. Um, but then I watched it. And I'm it's not I'm not saying it's as good as Free Guy or anything like that, but it was really quite good. It was much better than I thought it had any business being. And then you had Percy Jackson in there. By the way, I keep forgetting, is it Walker Scoble or is it Scoble Walker? I think it's Walker Scoble. Anyway. The kid who played the younger version of Ryan Reynolds, that was a revelation. This kid is going to be a superstar. Like an absolute superstar. Um, and, and Sean Levy did that. So you know what? Yeah, I, I'm very um, stoked with what Sean Levy and Ryan Reynolds were able to do together on Free Guy, on... Uh, the Adam project. And I think they're going to be able to, I hope, and I believe they're going to work their magic again with Deadpool three. And, and hopefully they're still Mint mobile is still a sponsor of mine tomorrow. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe they cancel who knows. Uh, all right. Next up, Bobby Jackson writes, I haven't bought a current gen gaming console, but I have a two year old gaming PC and I might make it my main way to play games. Uh, is there a way I can check if new games are playable before upgrading my PC. Um, <coughs> I wish Ray was here. Ray would be the better one to answer that. Look, I do know that they have, um, <coughs> pardon me, Microsoft going to pop that halls now. Microsoft has Game Pass that you can play the games on your PC. My guess would be this. If you have like a two-year-old PC though, if you bought a fairly decent PC two years ago. I've got a PC in our B studio right now. That's got to be five years old. And it's got, you know, it's, it's got um, an eight core processor in it. It's got a 70, 20 video card. And, you know, the last time we fired it up, I think Jonathan fired it up and was playing some games on it a while ago and it still functions fine. And that's like with a five-year-old computer, like a, a five-year-old computer. And it, it played pretty well with a 2070 card. So if you bought a computer like two years ago, um, as long as you bought a, you don't even have to buy a top of the line one two years ago. I mean, if you bought it two years ago, my guess is probably you've got a 3070 video card in it. I mean, that's better than the one I got. I, I think you'd be fine. I mean, I don't know if you could play the absolute newest AAA games at top ultra settings. Probably not. But I, I think you could still play them perfectly fine. That, that's just my guess, though. I, I don't know if there's... You're asking me, is there a place you can check that? I mean, every game should have a recommended and required list. Like required you have to have a four core processor you have to have a minimum you know 1060 video card you have to have a minimum this and a minimum of that and then they have recommended now you can have the minimum but we recommend you having this video card and this processor check those listings on the games see how that matches up with your pc that's the best advice a non-qualified person like me can give you all right let's see here uh next up we've got Sammy writes, hey, John, have you watched I Saw the Devil, the best Korean movie ever? I've never even heard of it. Um, you will no regret it. Probably meant not regret it. Uh, if you do and you don't like it, I will donate $1,000 to a charity of your choice. You will be amazed or I will be broke. Well, I mean, 
First of all, by the way, $24 Super Chat. Thank you so much, Sammy, for for contributing to our show that way. Well, I'll tell you what. I am just going to lie. Um, I got some great charities, Feed America, uh, that I'm just ready for you to send $1,000 to. So I will not take you up on the challenge because I will just lie about it because I'd like to see $1,000 more go to Feed America or, or one of the other family centers that we like to support around here. Um, but... Like I said, I've never even heard of it. So I will keep my eye open for it, though, Sammy. Thank you for the recommendation. I'll keep my eye open for it. And um, if I do get around to watching it, which I don't know if I will, but if I do get around to watching it, I will definitely make sure I let you know what I found of it, what I thought of it. All right. Next up, Orange Grove writes, uh, do you feel Disney is on the path to recover cr- to recovery creatively? Yes, but... It's one thing to be on the path to recovery. It's another thing to actually get to the destination. All right. The path to recovery needed two things. Number one, it needed Bob Iger to take over the CEO ship again of Disney and to eliminate that middle, that middle layer of management that Bob Chapek created that had no creatives on it whatsoever. Number two, it needed Bob Iger to re-give authority back to the creative leaders, which Bob Chapek took away their authority from the creatives. And then from a Marvel specific point of view, it specifically needed Bob Iger to give Kevin Feige his authority back, which again, Bob Chapek stripped like 50% of Kevin Feige's authority away from him. Um, So, Are they on the road to recovery creatively? Yes, they've taken the right first steps. Will they continue to walk that path and get there? Don't know. That all depends on how optimistic you are. Um, So are they they on the road? Yes. Will they get there? We're not really going to know for another year and a half. At least another year and a half, maybe two years. Um, before we really see the impact and the effects of the changes that got made, the right changes that got made. And we'll see if they get there. But uh, on the road, I would say yes on the road, but we'll see if they get there. Uh, Next up, KJ Walker writes, John, uh, what's up? What is your dream Deadpool 3 cameo? Don't have any. Cameos are cameos. They're generally really useless. Uh, They create a quick moment of, ooh, but they don't actually contribute anything to a movie. So I really don't care. Now, look, that being said, I'm not going to lie. Hearing that Jennifer Garner is going to pop up as Electra, I'm a big Jennifer Garner guy. So, yeah, that's very exciting for me. Do I like hearing that Halle Berry is probably going to pop up there a storm? Yeah, I like hearing that, too. But, like, I, I don't really. I think cameos are useless fluff. Do they give me a momentary smile and go, cool, sure they do but they don't make a movie any better. Um, so I don't really care that a lot about cameo. So I don't have any dream ca- cameo scenario. And listen, to not be like uh, facetious, if you're sitting beside me in the first screening of Deadpool and they have some pretty cool cameos, you'll probably hear me go, woo, or cool, or whatever, like be happy about it. But it's not really important to the overall movie. So I don't really have a, a dream scenario for a, uh, a dream cameo. Uh, All right. Uh, Next up, we go to uh, Spencer Nielsen, who writes, what are your thoughts on Maestro? I was very disappointed and I don't get why it's nominated for anything besides acting awards. Poor, poor script. I, I disagree. Listen, I didn't love Maestro. Okay. Personally, I have no problem. I think the movie is good enough that I have no problem that it's nominated for Best Picture. However, if I was a voting member of the Academy, which thankfully I am not, but if I was, I don't know that I would have given Maestro a nomination for Best Picture. Again, I think it's good enough that I have no problem that I got a nomination. It's a very good movie. But, um, (sighs) The scenes were great. I thought the dialogue was brilliant. The acting is top-notch. 
My problem with Maestro is that for really the entire movie, I found it to be aimless. I found it to be directionless. Not not that it wasn't being directed. It was clearly being directed, but I felt like the, like most even biopics, they have a definitive narrative that they're telling, right? Here's our character. Here's their challenge. These are the obstacles they face. And this is how it comes to conclusion. Whereas Maestro is kind of a, a movie that narratively just wanders. Like this part of the movie is kind of about this. And then this part of the movie is kind of about this other thing. And then now this part of the movie, they kind of have problems. And then in this part of the movie, they just solve their personal problems. And then, oh, she gets diagnosed with this. Like, it's it's a movie that wanders like 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 a like like a, a, a toddler you bring to the mall. You ever see those parents that put the leashes on their kids? I see some people parents shouldn't put a leash on their kids. You know what? I, 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 you shut the hell up because I've seen parents try to corral their kids and they can just go. I have no problem with a parent putting a leash on their kid to try to keep their kids safe and make sure they know where their kid is at all times. But that's kind of what Maestro felt to me. It, it just kind of felt like it meandered and it, 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 and it wandered kind of aimlessly filled with great dialogue and, and great performances. But that's why I think it's a very, very good movie uh, because it just checks so many of the boxes, but I, I, it falls short of true greatness for me because it just felt honestly, narratively aimless. It, and not everybody will agree with me, but that, that's how I felt about it. And since you're asking me, I'll give you my answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we got Lego Knight Alpha, who writes, uh, Hi, John. Hope everything is good. How important is for Deadpool 3 for MCU, seeing it's the only projected uh, they are releasing? Only projected movie they're releasing? Does it need to hit Avengers level? No, 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 no. It doesn't need to hit Avengers level, but it needs to be great. It needs to be great. We've talked a lot on our show about how vital it is, specifically because of the precarious situation the MCU finds itself in right now. You know, for those of you joining late, we, we mentioned earlier in the show, whether you think the MCU is doing pretty good right now, whether you think the MCU is doing really badly right now, I think we can all agree, at least most of us will agree, that right now the MCU is probably the most unhealthy it's been. Now, some of you might think that's absolutely terrible. Some of you may think it's not that bad at all. But I think we would all agree that in all the history of the MCU, it's always been healthier than it is right now. We can agree on that, I think. And given that, that has really driven home the fu- the fact that they need a movie like the like Guardians came along. Guardians of the Galaxy three came along at just the right time. Because Guardians of the Galaxy, I I think if Guardians of the Galaxy three hadn't come out, I think the perception of the MCU right now would be even worse. So they're not in a great spot right now, and that really makes it imperative that Deadpool crushes it. Because like I said earlier, we've got like eight months between movies. If Deadpool crushes it, then we've got eight months of anticipation for the next MCU movie because the last one, Deadpool 3, was so great. But it's a double-edged sword because if Deadpool 3 stinks, and I don't believe it will stink. Obviously, I think it's going to be great. But if it stinks, then we've got eight months of going, yeah, of sitting around for eight months with this bad taste in everybody's mouth of a bad Deadpool 3 movie. And again, I think Deadpool 3 will be awesome. But I have no problem, Lego Knight, saying it is imperative that this movie be great. It's got to be great. All right. Last Super Chat question. I, but for those of you who didn't know, I turned off Super Chats during the first commercial break. But CR writes, what's James Spader better performance? Raymond Reddington from Blacklist or Alan Shorn from Boston Legal? Alan Shorn from Boston Legal. No doubt. No question. He won multiple Emmys for that. 
listen, and I love Blacklist. Eh, it it, it kind of lost its footing near the end. Yeah. But uh, James Spader as, as Raymond Reddington is great. I love his performance in it. But James Spader playing Alan Shore opposite uh, William Shatner in Boston Legal is like defining television. It was, it's something I will always remember. And every once in a while, uh, I still go back to and and watch. I'll still go back on, on like YouTube every once in a while, just look up random clips from Boston Legal because William Shatner, by the way, all due respect to Star Trek, uh, William Shatner playing Denny Crane on Boston Legal is his best performance. William Shatner's best performance is in nothing that had to do with Starfleet. William Shatner's best performance is in Boston Legal. And him and James Spader playing off each other in that show was every time gold. Absolute gold. Um, it, it was just so good. So as much as I love the blacklist, as much as I love James Spader playing Raymond Reddington, James Spader as Alan Shore and Boston Legal, easy, no hesitation in me answering that 100%. <laughs> these webos is saying what about tj hooker all due respect to tj hooker all due respect to tj hooker but uh denny crane that is to me the career defining performance of uh william shatner all right guys I'll tell you what still got a few minutes here so i'm just going to go over to you guys in the live chat i'm just going to look to the live chat if you guys have a question for me Go ahead and fire it in the live chat. If it's a question for me and not just a comment, write it like this. Question. Um, uh, how good is ice cream? So <laughs> see this in the chat I just put in? Write question, colon, and then your question, just so I know that it's actually a question uh, that you have. And and I'm not going to be able to answer all of them, just so you know, I'm, I'll, but I'll, I'll pick out a couple here and uh, address those as I take another sip on my uh, drink here. Um, all right. And DB is saying ice cream is awesome. That is my one big, um, my one big vice, my one big vice. Uh, let's see. Daddy Logan is asking UFC 300 made predictions. I don't even know who's on UFC 300. I've stopped watching UFC. <clears throat> Not because I want to stop watching UFC. Uh, but I, I talked about this on the John Campus show a while ago. Uh, they've just priced me out. UFC has priced me out. It wasn't long ago that UFC um, was 50 bucks. Then it went up. <laughs> then when ESPN, and I love ESPN, but when ESPN took over the UFC broadcasts, it went up to 60 bucks. Okay. Now that was like two years ago. Then it went up to 65. Then it went up to 70. Then it went up to 75. And within two years, it's now at $80, 80 bucks. And I'm sorry, but that is too much to sit on my couch at home and watch one single fight card. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You, you've priced me out. And um, I'm, I'm not saying I'll never get a UFC again. I love MMA. Uh, you guys know, I go to my UFC gym, I train there, all that kind of stuff, but <clears throat> I'm it's just in principle, I am not spending $80 on a pay-per-view that I don't even know if the card's going to be any good, right? The fights could be yawners and all that kind of stuff. And they, I'm sorry, guys, you just priced me out. Dana White, I know you're not watching this, but if somebody shows this to you, Dana, I've been following UFC ever since the days of Hoist Gracie, man, and Oleg Taktarov and, and Tank Abbott. And, you know, and chemo and all the guys I've been watching religiously since then. And you, sir, have priced out a fan. So now I don't I don't get them anymore. I'll watch some of the free ones on the Saturday nights, but I, I don't watch the main ones anymore. I, I'm just, you priced me out anyway. It's just me. All right. Uh, next up, we've got. Um, interesting one. Um. Uh, Blackberry writes, 
Do you think there will be a season two of Mr. and Mrs. Smith? I'm four episodes into Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And I mentioned this on the John Campus show earlier today. I like the show because it's very much like Atlanta. It feels just like Atlanta. And I really liked Atlanta. The problem that I think why a lot of fans are kind of turned off by the show is because this show is nothing like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It's a completely different story. It's a completely diff different premise. It's a completely different feel. There is nothing remotely similar between the Mr. and Mrs. Smith movie and this show that they just seem to randomly slap the Mr. and Mrs. Smith title on. So, I mean, I don't know if they'll do a season two. I mean, I, I've i liked the first four episodes that I've watched, but I just don't know if enough people are digging it or not. So, uh, we'll see. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Ivan Rodriguez writes, did you watch the season finale of Percy? What do you think? Yeah, we talked about this on the John Campus show earlier today. Um, I, I liked Percy Jackson very much. I thought the show was very good. Uh, seeing Lance um, there at the end of Zeus, I thought that was really nice. I, I thought the, again, I liked the season very much overall. Big thumbs up for me. <clears throat> I felt like as a season finale, it was, it felt a little an anticlimactic just a little bit anticlimactic. I thought it could have been a little stronger, but uh, overall, again, love the show. I really had a really good time for the show with the show. Um, <clears throat> Michael Gonzalez is asking question, excitement level for the new planet of the apes movie. Not super excited because I thought the last planet of the apes movie wasn't all that great, but this trailer was a banger, man. That the one new Planet of the Apes trailer that came out was awesome. So I am, that has got me a little, so I will say I'm excited, like not Dune, Deadpool 3, um, or uh, Monkey Man level excited, but excited, excited nonetheless. So we'll, we'll look, uh, I'll look forward to that. All right, <laughs> time for a couple more. Um, let's just see, TF, uh, three one hundred is running. What is your final prediction for the Deadpool three title? No prediction. It's gonna be it's gonna be something that none of us have guessed. So I kind of given up uh, guessing uh, at all with that. Um, let's see. Alexandros is writing. Do you think Marvel slowing down this year is a step in the right direction? Yes, I think they need to reset a little bit, right? And I think having this time where all we've got theatrically is Deadpool four. Sorry, Deadpool three. Uh, and then we'll have like one or two of the Disney Plus shows come out. Uh, obviously, we had uh, um, Echo, which was not good. I I'm sorry. Echo was not good. Um, and I I'm dying to see. Um, why am I suddenly freezing? Uh, 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 Dark Hole Diaries. Um, <clears throat> why, am I why am I freezing on the name of Catherine Hahn's MCU show again? The name of the character. I just suddenly, I'm just brain cramping on it. Uh, Agatha. Agatha, uh, Darkhold Diaries, whatever. That, I'm, I'm very excited about that. So, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, it was a good, it's a good idea for them to take a breath, reset a little bit, and uh, we'll see. <clears throat> Question, what will be the top three best movies of the year? No idea. No idea. I, I very much believe the best movie of the year is probably going to be Dune. That will probably be the best movie of the year. But I, I mean, until we see them, Hard to say. <coughs> uh, let's see. Um, Canadian Spring writes, did you see the if teaser with Ryan Reynolds and Randall Park? Yes, I did. So funny. You guys know, <coughs> some of you may not know what we're talking about, but in The Office, Randall Park famously appeared on The Office as Asian Jim, right? where he pretends he's Jim to uh, to Dwight. And it just became known famously as Asian Jim. And that has always gone along with, with Randall Park. Well, in the new spotlight piece that's out for the upcoming, for John Krasinski's upcoming movie, If, that, he, that Ryan Reynolds is starring in, they do it all with Randall Park as John Krasinski. And it is one of the funniest promos I've seen since Deadpool. I wouldn't be surprised if the whole thing was Ryan Reynolds' idea. I don't know that it was. I'm just saying. But it was really, really, really great. All right. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, Sean uh, Congema writes, uh, thoughts on the passing of Carl Weathers? I mean, well, what thoughts are there to have? I, I mean, what a loss. The guy was just really finding his footing in the second, the second age of his career, you know, <coughs> with the popularity with Mandalorian. He was just doing those uh, new football spots with uh, Rob Gronkowski. I mean, he's he's finding his popularity again. He was finding a new uh, era for his career. Just a terrible loss, man. And, and so, yeah, like in his early 70s, the dude looks super healthy, too. So it was very, very sad uh, to hear that. All right. Uh, Brody Weaver writes, I plan on going to film school for college in the near future. Any tips on how to start? On how to start going to film school? <clears throat> Go to film school. Uh, find the school that you think looks best for you. Sign up hand over tuition check and start attending classes. That is the best way to start, uh, to, to, to start going to film school in my completely amateur opinion. Uh, let's see question, super bowl score prediction and MVP. Uh, I think the score is going to be 30 to 16 for the San Francisco 49ers. I think Christian McCaffrey ends up as a super bowl MVP again, though, any team that has Mahomes as their quarterback, never doubt for a second how, no matter the odds, that that team can pull it out. All right? Mahomes is that kind of quarterback. I still think the San Francisco 49ers win and win handily. But as long as Patrick Mahomes is on the field, anything can happen. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh Chrysla writes, how awesome would it be if Adrian Paul played Ramirez in the Highlander reboot? Not all that awesome, to be honest with you. By the way, I know who's playing. I know who's playing Ramirez in the Highlander reboot. I also know who's playing Kurgan. I, I, and it's not just, oh, I guess, no, 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 no. I, 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 I can't tell you how, but I know. I know who's playing Ramirez. I know who's playing Kurgan. And I'm very, very happy about both. Um, <laughs> the problem with Adrian Paul, um, with the idea of Adrian Paul coming in and playing Ramirez, it, two big problems. Number one, not enough people watch the Highlander show that that would have a lot of meaning to them anyway. And number two, I would rather get a really top-notch actor playing that role. And they got a top-notch actor to play the role. Anyway, anyway. Um, so, but listen, what I, I'd be all for Adrian Paul playing a cameo. I, I'd be all for Adrian Paul popping in his. I would love it if Christopher Lambert and Adrian Paul. I think it would be a shame if they didn't have some l little cameo appearance for each of them uh, somewhere in the movie. But uh, but as far as him playing. Ramirez, I, I don't think that would be a good choice, to be honest with you. But that, that again, that's just me. Um, let's see. Um, you know what? <clears throat> Still a couple more, but my voice, I'm starting to cough a bit. We've gone over two hours. So you know what, guys? That'll do it for today's installment of Open Mic. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Uh, don't forget, like I said, we still had more questions to go on the tip link questions. We will go through all the remaining tip link questions. And if you have more questions you want to send in, go ahead, use the tip link. <coughs> uh, the link should be in the description below. Streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. Go ahead and fire those in. Uh, we'll get through the rest of those tomorrow and take more live open questions tomorrow as well. So, That'll do it for me for tonight, guys. I think my wife and uh, some friends of ours, including Ray, are waiting for me to go have dinner, so I'm going to go do that. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.